All right, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to our Stride speaker series um, all around leading through adversity. Uh, it's a 10 speaker, 10 topic series to give everyone a full 360 degree view of, of leading through these very uncertain times as Jeff and I were just chatting about before this. Uh, my name is Rob O'Brien. I'm a product principal manager here at uh, Stride Consulting who's, who's been hosting these. Um, for those of you who don't know Stride, we are a consultancy that helps companies of all scales, both large and small, help develop um, product and engineering teams use technology to solve business problems. Uh, this can vary from actual delivery of your first release or an MVP or an idea you have, um, and also can vary to just straight up coaching and, and improving how your team thinks and the mindsets and the way your team works. Um, we work with, again, all different sorts of organizations and all different um, industries. So feel free to reach out to us. We'd, we'd love to help. Today, we have Jeff Gotthelf. He is the author of Lean UX sense and respond and his new book which i told you i'd give you a shout out to uh forever employable um so he'll be speaking there you go if you look at jeff he's holding it up today he'll be speaking with us about continuously learning our way to be to better outcomes uh, i'll probably have jeff speak for around 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll open the floor to conversations and, and questions but feel free to post any questions in the chat i'll monitor that and where appropriate kind of jump in um jeff if that's okay with you and interrupt to, to raise any questions that feel like they're they're really related to the topic yeah. But with that, I will pass it over to you, Jeff. Terrific. Hey, folks. Um, nice to see some familiar faces. Nice to meet some of you for the first time. Um, and uh, excited to share this talk. This is, um, it, I'm going to share my screen with you and, and just put up some slides so um, you can see them. And there they are. Um, and so, look, the, um, the, this, this is a, a talk that I've been giving for about a year or so, maybe a year and a half. And it's, it's becoming increasingly more relevant um, these days, especially kind of in the, in the, with the, the turbulence of the pandemic, as well as the, uh, the political climate in the US and abroad and other places as well. And so um, it's, it's kind of a two part talk. The, the, the first half of the talk, and I'll get into it right away, is, is kind of set up for the concepts and the foundations of uh, sensing and responding and, and learning our way to better outcomes. And then the second half of the talk, really starts to put a bit of a more of a cautious lens on that conversation. And what I hope it will do is kind of force you, force you to pause and think a little bit, kind of the next time you're, you're thinking about um, what you're working on, what its purpose is, how it's being used, that type of thing, and, and how you can use your position as, as a maker, right? Whether you're a product manager, a designer, an engineer, a leader, um, to positively influence the, the work that you're doing and positively impact the, the, the users or the customers that you have for your products. And so, look, this is where I started my career. I started my career 20, 21 years ago um, at, at AOL. And when, when I started working in the 90s, this is what software looked like in the 90s, you know, and, and during, uh, you know, at that time, our learning loops were long, the feedback loops that we could get by, you know, when you printed CDs, uh, were long at, at AOL, we would publish a CD, you know, a new version of the, of the software once every six months, print 15 million copies of the CD, mail it to you, wait for you to install it, if you installed it, get some feedback, work for another six months. It's a 12 month feedback loop. You know, the adoption of the software was slow. There was no guarantee uh, that people would actually install the CD or you know, you had to go to a store and buy software in a box at the time. And so adoption of software was slow. The impact of the software that we created at the time was limited to the tech savvy and those who could actually afford a computer back then and the goal of the work that we were doing was works as designed right so as long as it, it, as it met the specifications and we shipped it on time and close enough that was the goal because the measure of success was just getting it out the door right that was that's how uh, we measured success back then and that was you know that was, was not that long ago and there's still a lot of companies kind of thinking like this right but a lot has changed in the last 20 years most importantly, software has eaten the world. As, as Andreessen warned us in 2011, that software was eating the world, right? At this point, it has consumed the world. And especially kind of now in this pandemic situation, really we're leaning even more heavily on technology to stay connected, to 
to get our essentials, to work, to communicate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and software really powers everything, right? It powers our phones, uh, it powers our, our coffee makers, right? There's technology there. And, you know, people try to stick technology pretty much everywhere. Uh, somebody tried to stick it into a salt shaker and make uh, the smalt the world's first uh, connected salt shaker, right? There's no, no limits to where technology can be put into and how it can change the world. But what's far more interesting, I think, not, is not just the proliferation of technology into devices and into our daily lives, but it's how software is made today, right? Software is the fundamental nature of software is different today than it was back then. Whereas back then, there was this very linear process and then you shipped and that was it. And that you, you were done, you were literally done because you're gonna start the next, the next version of it. Today, software is continuous, right? But we build systems and these systems never end, right? There's no end to the software, right? The, the, the sort of tongue in cheek question that illustrates this is, you know, when is Amazon done? Right? When is Netflix done? Right? They're never done, right? They, they're, they're Facebook, right? They're never done. They continue to optimize the systems and um, move forward. And we're seeing organizations, some organizations get this. So I really like this quote. This is a quote from um, Francisco Gonzalez, who's the group executive chairman of BBVA. BBVA is a big Spanish bank. And um, they're doing a lot of interesting things around technology and innovation. And that part highlighted there in orange is the key part of this quote. He says, look, we are competing in a race that has no finish line or predetermined route, which is a remarkable realization for somebody in that type of leadership position. You don't normally hear that, but he's acknowledging that we are working with systems. These continuous systems never end. And the path to success is not linear, right? It's not like a clear roadmap to get there. And it's fascinating to hear that because for, for decades, if not longer, right, the way that organizations have thought about innovation and have thought about improvement of the products and services was to sell you the next version of the thing, right? Um, which is, you know, most companies still think this way. They think about things like automotive companies think about the model year, right? The only way, generally speaking, to get your car to do new things is to buy next year's model. And uh, there's absolutely no reason for that. It's a marketing gimmick. It's a marketing gimmick invented by uh, Alfred Sloan at, at General Motors 100 years ago to get you to keep buying cars over and over again. But we've taken that model and you know we've applied it to software right it's forever windows 95 windows 98 windows 2000 and it takes innovators right it takes honestly it takes software people or at least software minded people to come in and upend an industry and really force them to think differently now tesla is fascinating in a variety of different ways a lot of positive stuff some weird stuff maybe some negative stuff as well um, but the bottom line is that these were software folks thinking about building cars, in this case, electric cars. And the difference here is that you don't necessarily have to buy the 2020 model or the 2021 model to get your Tesla to do new things, right? Your Tesla does new things by sitting in the driveway overnight. And then when you wake up in the morning, the software updated, and now the car can drive itself or can park itself or can meet you around the house. And what's interesting is that Tesla builds this kind of intelligence into everything that they do and the entire system that supports the cars themselves. And so this article here in the middle, it talks about how Tesla you know, um, went from a tweet to a ship feature in six days. This guy Loic tweets at, me, at Elon Musk and he says, listen, um, every time I go to the supercharger in San Mateo, people have their cars plugged in and they've walked away and their cars are charged and I can't charge my car. And Elon Musk, you know, generally speaking, he's, he's listening, he's sensing, and he's responding to feedback, to feedback. He's the CEO of the company. And he says, look, you know, this is a problem, I'm on it. And then six days later, Tesla ships a software update. And that software update updates the supercharger system. And now every minute that you remain connected to a charger after your car is full, costs you money, right? 
and that fundamentally changes not not the system but the the, the, the kind of the, the way that the system operates and the only way that they can do this is because they think like a software company there is no way that a BMW or a Mercedes or a General Motors could react to something like this and change the way that the vehicles work in six days, which is crazy. I have a, I have a buddy um, in Virginia who uh, has a Tesla, he's got a Model 3, and he, he loves this kind of stuff, and he sa sends me these screenshots of his phone, I mean, of, of the app, right? And he's like, hey, I woke up this morning and my car got more powerful, <laughs> right? Like literally, I did nothing, uh, and my car can do new things. It's 5% more powerful with the software update. That's the kind of stuff that we can do with continuous systems, right? We can continuously improve the customer experience, the user experience. And, and with this capability comes tremendous opportunity, right? We've got the opportunity to, to use these systems to create a continuous conversation with the people that we serve on a regular basis, right? We can get ideas into market quickly small things, right? Small updates, prototypes, whatever it is, into the hands of our customers very quickly. We can sense very quickly how those things affect the behavior of our customers because we collect that data from our systems. And then we have the option to answer the question, what are we going to do about it, right? If it's positively impacting customer behavior, what are we gonna do about it? If it's negatively impacting customer behavior, what are we gonna do about it? And the nice thing about it is that our goal should be to get through this feedback loop as quickly as possible. This is a feedback loop, right? And the reason why we wanna get through this feedback loop as quickly as possible is because every time we get through this cycle, we learn something. And the faster that we can learn that thing, the less we've invested in that thing which means that if we find out that we're wrong, that it was a bad idea, it didn't help the customer experience, it didn't, it didn't help in any particular way, it hurts less. We can let that idea go and figure out how to improve it and move it forward, right? And what this ultimately does is it forces us to rethink how we treat the technology that we build into our businesses that powers our businesses. And ultimately, it's moving away from this model of a software factory, right? The idea that generating more features is value is actually false, right? More code does not actually equal more value. In fact, the only thing that more code guarantees that you get is more code, right? That's it. It's the only guarantee. Beyond that, whether it's valuable or not depends, right? And so we've got to change our measure of success, right? The, the deployment of features doesn't necessarily make the system better. It's the optimization of it. Because at the end of the day, look, it's a lot of like, you know, well, we can build it, so let's ship it, right? And the reality is that we just continue to ship features without actually sensing and sensing whether or not they're delivering value. You end up with products like this that I may mean, look cool to some folks, but the reality is that, um, you know, you're, you're going to use, if you're going to use it at all, you're going to use, you know, a tenth of that particular product. It doesn't, but this is like, you know, Microsoft Word in electric guitar form, basically. Right? That's, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about, right? So our measure of success has to change from features or output to outcome. Outcomes are measurable changes in user behavior. Um, they tell us when we've delivered value because we see customers doing things differently than they did before, and they're doing it differently in a way that benefits them. And it's these outcomes that tell us when we're done. And when we focus on our customers and their behaviors, we fundamentally shift the conversation within our organization and we can um, foundationally impact the success of our organizations as well. One of the more interesting case studies that's happened in the last few years is the guitar business. Uh, Gibson Guitars filed for bankruptcy. It felt, and it's really sad, actually. Um, and, and they filed for bankruptcy because um, what happened was they, they noticed that guitar sales were going down. And they hired a CEO who was a staunch advocate for innovation. And he was obsessed with innovation, right? All he wanted to do was put out new features, new gadgets, new, 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 new uh, 
things that they could add on and plug into because that's how he thought that uh, they would deliver value. Instead of actually understanding why guitar sales were plummeting, who was actually buying guitars. And so they're pushing out uh, new gadgets and new features that, that their target audience doesn't need. And if you won't go to their website, right, nothing on their website ever changed to really address any fundamental changes in their marketplace. They're still advertising with sort of the traditional guitar gods, right? So Slash in this particular case. Now, the, the fundamental, the, fundament, the, 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 the interesting thing here is that Fender, a company that at, at the risk of starting a holy war, makes basically the same product as Gibson, right? I understand, I'm a musician, I play piano, but at its core level, they make electric guitars too, okay, <laughs> right? Fender is thriving. And Fender is thriving because they set out to understand their customers and their needs and they're building products and services that impact the behavior positively of those customers. Right? And it turns out that half of new guitar buyers these days are women, right? And so for, for a lot of that target audience, after speaking with them, what they learned was that, you know, they don't need new gadgets and new toys. They want to learn how to play guitar, teach me how to play guitar, build instruments that fit me better. Right? And, and frankly, I'm not that interested in Slash necessarily. I'm interested in other players as well. This is what Fender's website looks like, looks like and they are thriving, right? And they, they're, they're continuously improving this based on the behavior of their customers. Now, here's the challenge. The challenge is that we cannot predict behavior, right? We think that we know how to solve problems for folks. We think that based on our experience and our expertise, that will get people to behave in a certain way, but people are stubborn, right? So this is an intersection in Massachusetts, and you know uh, what we call drivers in Massachusetts. I'll just assume that you know. Uh, and uh, I used to live there, so I can say that. I just want to be very clear. I've got, I've got rights to use that word. In any case, you're the person, and you'll notice in this particular photo that there is a right turn only arrow on the road, and that folks are turning left. And so somebody's job was to get folks to turn right at this intersection. And actually they wanted them to stop first before turning right. And so that individual did what they thought should work, right? They put up a stop sign and a no left turn sign. Now those signs work as designed, right? They, they, they meet the specs there. They, they meet you know, everything, but they didn't actually work, right? They didn't get the drivers in Massachusetts to stop and not turn left in this intersection, even though they should have, it should have made sense, but there's a different driver here. The difference here is this, the signs are the output, They're the things that we build to try to solve this particular problem in the world, the behavior is the outcome. Our goal is to change that behavior, not necessarily to shift those features. We wanna get people to stop turning left and get them to turn right. And again, you know, we do this with software a lot and software systems are complex and unpredictable. Um, humans are also complex and unpredictable and they will work around the obstacles that you put in front of them if they don't meet their patterns, right? If they, they wanna do certain things, they will work around them to do what they need, right? And, and again, the challenge with all of this is even if, we, even if we figure out our user's behavior, it's not static, it's something that evolves and in fact, it emerges through the use of the systems that we build ultimately. So there's new behavior that we never would have predicted when we built our systems in the first place, right? So even if, even if we have a specific thing that we'd like people to do, they end up doing things that we never, we never expected, right? Um, Instagram is a really good example of this um, and they continue to do this on a regular basis, but Instagram is the place where you go and you post that one perfect picture of the day. And that's a lot of pressure, right? Hey, more, I took a lot of photos today. Which one am I going to put up on Instagram? It turns out it's a ton more pressure for teenage girls to do that. So uh, a girl will go to the beach. Someone will take this photo of her. Um, the cropped part is what ends up going up on Instagram. And dad over there in the gray shorts doesn't make Instagram in the crop, right? Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a lot of pressure. And so what... Instagram never predicted was this concept of Finsta. Uh, Finsta accounts are fake Instagram accounts that are largely created by teenage girls. They're private groups of close friends 
or they can do stuff like this, stuff in the photo. They can take a photo that no one, not, not very many people will see. They can write on it, they can mess with it, and they can um, discard it when, when they're done with it, right? Because this relieves the pressure of publicly posting that one perfect picture of the day. Instagram never predicted this behavior, but they saw it emerge through the use of their system. They saw it emerge outside of their system in Snapchat. The rise of Snapchat clearly echoed this Finsta trend outside of Instagram as well. And so they copied that and they brought Instagram stories uh, into the Instagram experience. They continue to optimize that. And yesterday, right, with all the TikTok drama going on, they launched Reels, which is a TikTok competitor. So behavior that's emerging inside and outside of our system right? We can continuously improve our systems to make them better, right? And we can use our systems, to, we can use this ability to learn continuously to make our users more successful. But, and this is where it gets even more interesting in my opinion, sometimes the things that we do to optimize our systems can seem trivial, but these things end up creating unintended consequences right so let's take twitter for example right twitter um this idea of the hashtag right a lot of stuff that we love about twitter came through emergent use of the system right so twitter didn't invent the hashtag uh chris messina i believe uh invented the the hashtag so let's, let's use that and twitter uh in 2009 supports it adds hyperlinks for hashtags that begin to monetize hashtags, really all the things that, that we know and love about Twitter, the at replies and retweets, all that stuff emerged through the use of the system. Now there are other behaviors that emerged through the use of the system that began to get Twitter and Facebook and others in trouble, right? All of a sudden, there's all kinds of behaviors happening on Twitter that no one predicted, these unintended consequences. And uh, it's starting, you know, started this kind of ongoing reckoning of social media both with themselves with the public and with authority and then you know we were looking to these ceos to then come to the rescue and solve this and what's interesting is that this is a, this is a really i think a really transparent statement from jack who you know vacillates from super cool to like super uncool guy at times which is really interesting but i found this statement to be really interesting and transparent he said he said look uh, we didn't fully predict or understand the real world negative consequences. Hey, we built Twitter and people started doxing each other and harassing each other and sending death threats. We didn't know they were going to do that, right? Um, and so, um, you know, they, in, instead of, of um, uh, they, they didn't build a systemic framework to encourage healthy debate and conversation because they never saw this actually coming, which is the approach that we need. And so their goal is to work fast and learn and share uh, the ongoing conversations from that, right? And Twitter, of course, gave him the kind of response that he deserves for that, which is what Twitter does best in some situations, right? Which is kind of challenging these folks to do that. Now, what's interesting is that the reason why this happened is because Twitter was optimizing for outcomes. They were optimizing for engagement, for tweets, for retweets, for, for, for that, whatever, whatever counts for engagement, user retention, that type of thing. And what we're seeing there, and what we're gonna see in a series of examples I'm gonna share with you in just a second, is that if we don't consciously pay attention to the outcomes, to the metrics that we're optimizing for, and we do it blindly without considering the real world implications, at best, that's risky. And at worst, and I'll show you some example of, examples of this, it's criminal. And this is something that we as makers, as we have to pay attention to continuously. Now, let me show you some examples of this, and then, and then um, I've got a bunch of examples, and then, and then we'll talk about it in the Q&A, right? So engagement, right? Blindly optimizing for engagement. Of course, the 800-pound gorilla in the room with this is Facebook, and there's a thousand different things we can talk about about Facebook, but the, the gifts that Facebook has given us and so many other companies is the outcome metrics of Mal and Dow, monthly active users and daily active users, which for Facebook makes sense. 
For other companies, maybe not so much, but Facebook focuses on driving daily engagement, daily active usage of the service, and certainly monthly active usage of the service. And there are situations after situations where they have done things to encourage this kind of daily activity that has actively hurt people, right? They were clearly implicated as a platform that enabled the proliferation of human rights abuses in Myanmar, right? People were outing the minorities that were being persecuted in Myanmar on Facebook, because Facebook is the internet in Myanmar. And essentially, they were aiding genocide there. They were clearly uh, you know, noticed, uh, noted for this, right? Um, and they would have to you know, fix this and get it right. They were seeing people engage in Facebook. So they were showing them more of the same stuff that was engaging them, which was, hey, I found this, this minority over here, this minority over there, let's, let's go get them, right? Um, when it comes to their, their uh, political advertising, right, uh, very famously, up until yesterday, or I think maybe even this morning, right, up until yesterday, basically, they are like, look, if someone's going to lie on the platform, well, it drives engagement, so especially politicians, we're just going to keep it up there, right? I think they did censor a Trump thing today. But generally speaking, they're like, look, if it drives engagement, we're going to keep it on the ad, we're going to keep it on the app, and we're going to keep showing it to people. Right? YouTube is the same thing. Also optimizes for engagement, time on site, number of videos views, viewed. Those are all outcomes. Those are all measures of customer behaviors, and they're continuously optimizing for that. Right? But this is, you, you start to, whether on purpose or accidentally, watch some content on YouTube that might, be, that might have some negative content, and they're going to show you 50 more videos like that. And all of a sudden, YouTube is being used as a radicalization vehicle for, for folks to, to really like turn them against society and whatever else, right? Because the algorithm continues to serve you up more of the stuff that you're watching. And the metrics go up and everybody's happy, right? Advertisers happy, right? So that's engagement. Um, in the name of sales, when we blindly optimize for outcomes in sales, it can cause relationship stress. There was a very famous, uh, I think it was a famous story about how Target figured out through data analytics, and, and, and uh, you know, machine learning and that type of thing, uh, they can figure out when you're pregnant based on what you search for and what you buy and that type of behavior. And Target figured out that a teenage girl was pregnant based on her search history and based on what she was buying at the store. And they began to send her um, advertisements targeting pregnant women to her house and to her browser and her parents found those things before she had told them that she was pregnant, right? So all of a sudden, Target is outing the pregnancy, this girl's pregnancy to her parents, right? Someone wrote the code to capture all that data. Someone wrote the code to analyze that data. And someone wrote the, you know, optimized this behavior, right? To drive the kind of sales outcomes that we we're looking for, not thinking about the negative, the potentially negative real world consequences. Uh, in the name of efficiency, we can drive up discrimination. Um, Amazon wrote an, an AI to screen resumes because they get tens of thousands of resumes all the time. Well, the biases of the people who wrote the AI ended up in the training of that algorithm that, that was sorting through these resumes and it scored resumes lower that included words like women's or women's chess club or all women's colleges. And it reduced the, the viability of those resumes because of the biases that were built into that algorithm based on the people who wrote that particular code, right? And that's something that, that again, we think is, is increasing the efficiency. The efficiency is an outcome, right? To make our recruiters more efficient, is an outcome, it's a, it's a benefit to the business, it's a benefit to the people who are applying for jobs at the, at the organization, but there's a negative real world consequence here. Um, AI, again, using video, your performance on video, to determine and to comp compare and contrast it against 25,000 other video clips of people who have done your job well, to determine whether or not you're going to do your job well. And again, um, inevitably, these algorithms have built in biases in the databases that could discriminate against some candidates. And again, all of this is in the name of efficiency. 
and someone's writing this code and someone's publishing these, this software and continuously improving, right? Um, in the name of convenience, we can actually use these tools to hurt people. Again, we don't, we don't make, most people don't make these products with the intention of this happening, right? But we have to start to think consciously about how we're optimizing the usage of our products. So home automation systems, smart homes, right? Internet connected locks and speakers and thermostats and lights and cameras are amazing conveniences that are now also being used as a means for harassment. So couples break up, right? And they break up on bad terms and all of a sudden they are now abusing each other by messing with the house, locking the doors, turning the heat all the way up or the AC all the way down, the lights off, right? Turning the alarms on and off, that type of thing. Again, none of this behavior was planned for, but nobody, nobody even paid attention to it until it was too late in the system because we're optimizing for the convenience of the system, which again is an outcome. Uh, and then look in the name of news, right? And, and viewership and eyeballs, it can really elevate, uh, elevate the worst in us too to, uh, you know, and we continue to see this happening today, right? Um, and the reality is, is this, um, all the people who built these particular products and services thought they were solving user needs, right? And I'm solving a problem for a customer. I'm making it more efficient or more convenient or more engaging or more interesting or selling more stuff or whatever it is, right? And the question we have to continuously ask ourselves today, especially as we're building these systems, is are we solving user needs or are we exploiting user needs, right? Because both of these things can make you money. And I, I feel like it's our responsibility to ask ourselves on a daily basis what business we want to be in, right? And I, I'm gonna say this, I, I agree with, uh, with Ellen Powell here, I don't think that the leaders, especially of these larger organizations, are, are the people who are gonna save us from this, right? I think they're incentivized to drive these types of engagement metrics. And I think that we're seeing in a lot of cases, they're choosing to ignore a lot of this stuff. And so as you're going to work every day, there's something to keep an eye on, right? And I, I hear this a lot. Um, I was going to say in my travels, we don't travel anymore, but, um, but it, certainly in my, in my former travels and in my work today, I see stuff like this a lot, right? Uh, from engineers, I hear, uh, I trust my product manager. That's great. Good. Trust and verify, as, as Jeff Bezos likes to say, right? Your, your, your product manager probably did good work. Make sure. Ask those questions. Ask about the edge cases. Ask about those uh, potentially negative real-world consequences before we implement and optimize the system. And this idea of like, look, I just wanna write code, right? I'm sorry, but I don't, like that, I don't think that job should, like the job where all you're doing is, is just writing code, I don't think that job should exist anymore, right? I don't think you can blindly write the code without actively thinking about the people who will be using that code and how it might affect their life, right? And as my friend Kenneth says, to kind of drive this home, right? He said, look, the new technologies and everything you're making is new technology, right? The new technologies bear the ethical fingerprints of their creators, not of wider society. So the ethics of ourselves, our teams, our company is what shows up in the code. It shows up in the customer experience, right? Not necessarily broader society. And so the question that we have to continually ask is what will our code or our designs or our requirements or whatever it is be used to do? Because I'll tell you this, right? When it goes south, it's not the CEOs who are going to go to jail, right? It's you who will pay the price. Um, if you don't know who this is, this is a guy named James Liang. He's a software engineer. And he wrote the code that, for Volkswagen that cheated the diesel emission sensors. Right? What did he think people were going to do with that code? Right? He's in jail. You got a four-year jail term. The CEO of Volkswagen did not. He, he made even more money last year than the year before, right? And so as I finish this up, just a couple of, a couple of thoughts to think about here. I, I love this. As we think about our work on a day-to-day -day basis and, and using these continuous systems to learn and improve and make our customers more successful and our businesses more successful, um, to do it consciously with eyes open and to be, uh, as Kim says, goal-driven 
values guided and to measure both. So goals are the metrics, the outcomes that we're targeting, right? Values are the things that we are not willing to sacrifice to achieve the goal. And we should be very explicit about that. We should, we should write those things down as a team, as an organization, and kind of put them up on the wall so we can point to them and say, look, I think we're violating this value, right? That, that's the type of thing. Um, and so to wrap this up, sort of what, what can you do, right? A lot of folks say, well, what can I do? I'm an engineer, I'm a product manager, right? If you're not in a position, if you're not in a position of power, um, first of all, understand your business model. Understand how your company makes money, right? What do you sell to make money? Very, very important. A lot of folks don't know that. Um, take an interest in your customers, get to know them, meet them, listen to them, watch them use your products and services on a regular basis. Use the software to learn, right? So don't just ship stuff and, and, and put it behind you and say that it's done, but use the system models now to learn how your work is impacting these folks and then measure the impact of that work on a regular basis. Don't be afraid to bring up these dangerous edge cases. What if somebody does this? How do we stop somebody from using the system in this particular way? And if you see that work, those dangerous edge cases creep into the work, don't be afraid to refuse the work that harms people. It's your responsibility not to build this stuff. It's your responsibility to raise your hand and say, look, this, I'm gonna walk away from this. And I guarantee you, you're gonna find support within your organizations to do that. And so to kind of wrap this up, I'll say, look, uh, Jurassic Park has a quote for everything, uh, and this is no exception as well. Um, and this is kind of summarizes um, what I've been talking about today, right? Um, it says your scientists were so preoccupied with it, whether or not they could, right? We could build all of these amazing things. We didn't stop to think if we should. And I'm just asking you to stop and think about whether we should be doing this. That's all as we move forward. And so with that, I want to say thank you very much for listening. Again, I do have a new book out. It's, it's actually available now. It's not just for pre-order. Um, it's not about this topic that I talked about, but I think you'll love it anyway. But in any case, um, I'm happy to, to take questions and discussions. And whatever. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Let's toss it up to just some conversation and questions. You have about 20 minutes left. Uh, let's maybe take 15, and then I'll spend the last five wrapping up. Feel free to just unmute your microphone and um, bring it up. I will say this while you're thinking about a question to ask. Um, I've given this talk a few times and um, often there aren't a ton of questions <laughs> after this, right? No, and it's, and it's, and it's fair. Yeah. I mean, obviously if you, if you have a question, please do ask. I'm not, I'm not trying to discourage you from asking, but my experience has been that often there aren't a ton of questions because it's, it's just kind of a lot to think about. But if you do have any questions, I'd love to hear them. It's not like Rob was unmuting yet. I, I noticed Jeff that you spelled um, behavior with a U. <laughs> and, and so I'm wondering if you're Canadian. No, I'm not. I'm not. The um, the I, I bought my most my latest uh, laptop here in Europe, okay. and uh, and so it it defaults to UK English, and I know it. I've forgotten that. Sorry. I thought maybe you were Canadian like me. No. No. I'd like I, I, these days. I tell you here in Europe, I have to tell everybody I'm South Canadian. But that's, that's <laughs> <my answer. laughs> No one has any questions. I have a couple of thoughts that I, I were really taking, taking me. I, I did a lot with um, you know data and AI earlier in my career, and all of the conferences were about this type of topic. Like, hey, as we're getting better at this, please, as the community of people that are working with the data, take the time to think about if you should do it. So, in a lot of the examples you brought up, really interesting. Um, the one that also came to mind about that ethical was kind of the, in my mind, was the, the Microsoft Internet Explorer issues. It's like, look, we want to have the best browser. We want to kind of capture this market. They got in a lot of trouble for that. Um, yeah, it's really, I think it's really interesting. But look, I mean, look, look think about this, right? So, so at the beginning of the talk, I talked about my experience at AOL, right? That, that feedback loop, that adoption cycle, it was, it was low impact because, you know, it, it didn't affect the, the, the sheer number of people the internet affects today. Um, it took time, adoption was slow, et cetera. The ability to reach, you know, the world today quickly is insanely fast. Right, the, the the ability to get ideas out to market quickly, and so it, it's it's even more important now to start asking these tough questions, or or just just to raise them, to, to continuously just be just raise them and say, look, how do we stop people from thinking about this? How do we stop, you know? Um, and and there's all kinds of ways that you, you could you could discuss that. You can talk about um, you know kind of worst case scenarios um, and try to try to design against them. 
Um, but there is there are exa there's examples after examples after examples that show that when when teams don't think about this, you can't predict user behavior, right? It showed you that in, in three or four different examples, right? People are gonna are gonna try to abuse the systems and and do that moving forward. And we've got to we've got to be the advocates for the user always in this particular case. Thoughts, questions, go ahead, Stephen. Oh, I don't think we can hear you, Stephen. Yeah, you're unmuted, but we can't actually hear you. Okay. Double there muted. you go. There you go. All right. um, so I, I just I thought I'd make a, a comment, um, especially the thing you just said there, Jeff. We're we've got to be the advocate for the customer, and um, it's quite an interesting experience. I, I work at Microsoft uh, and the, the Visual Studio team at Microsoft. And we, over the last few years, have sort of, sort of transformed our, our culture within the developer division to be one from, you know, 20 years ago when I joined the company, it was a case of, well, we know it all. We don't need to talk to customers. Why should we talk to them? And now we're a, we, we're, we're a learn it all culture. We know nothing. You know, we have to speak to customers all the time. And we have that shared learning. And when I say we, I don't just mean the 20 UX researchers that we have in a division of 2,500 people. I mean those 2,500 people. So my job has been to coach the rest of the division now on how to speak to customers, how to learn from customers. And when that's a continuous process, you start to pick up on trends and things way earlier than we might ever. So some of these unintended consequences and unintended behaviors, we start to become more visible. And because there's, it's shared, it's not, it's not as if you know, the UX research team has done some work and discovered something, then we have to convince the rest of the division that this is happening. Sometimes a, a lot of these insights come from you know, developers on our, on, on our product, observing other developers, you know, testers observing other, you know, whoever. It's shared and it's out in the open, it's continuous. Um, of course, I'm sounding like a, like a fanboy here. You know, I'm very proud of my division and what we've done and everything. You know, but um, I've seen the transformation in 20 years of working in this division from being that sort of know-all culture to now this openness and, hey, we know nothing. Let's go, let's go talk and learn. And we pick up on trends and these sorts of things. And I'm not saying that uh, you know, we're never, we're, that, we're, that it's, it's anywhere near perfect and that we will always find all these unintended behaviors and everything. But there is something about sharing that learning and, and not feeling like we, the, the product managers, the researchers, whoever are the advocates that, you know, in fact, there was a quote at Product Tank or something a while ago that said, you know, how dare we even think that we are the voice of the customer? The customer is the voice of the customer. It's up to us to, 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 to learn from the customer. And I think that's, you know, and important that that share that learning that you know, be continuous learning and, and, and shared and, and transparent is just um, it, it's it, it's what it's what magic for us in dev dev and of course we are we, we focus on outcomes and everything as well just uh, just like you're saying Jeff but that shared experience I think is is really uh, really has been really important to help us change the culture within the developer division. What, what what do you think? It's fascinating to hear, right? And it sounds like you've been there twenty years. Like, what what drove that change, right? And that, look, it's a massive company, right? So yeah. driving that kind of cultural change in an organization of that size feels like an impossible task. How did it, how did it happen? Yeah, um, yeah. Funny enough, there's there's a we published a book just shortly uh, a short while ago. Uh, one of my colleagues, Travis Loudermilk, wrote a book about how we sort of hacked the culture at DevDev. But one of the key things, the motivation for it was that, um, you know, it was clear that lots of developers, we had, you know, we came out with the .NET framework you know, almost 20 years ago and more and more people were just moving off, you know, Windows, Microsoft, it was the uncool, you know, nobody wanted to do anything with Microsoft, you know, .NET, Windows, right. I think it was so uncool, you know, that you wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. We saw that, you know, we, we could, uh, we could see our, our numbers weren't, uh, our engagement numbers or the developers we had weren't going in the right direction. So from the top, there was a directive to, hey, we need to do something here. But from the bottom as well, we were, um, it was around about the whole the time agile, lean, the, the engineers were talking about 
uh, we used to have three year life cycles. It's funny you said AOL, you had six month, uh, six month product life cycles. We had three year life cycles, which were just mm -hmm. horrendous. Nobody enjoyed it. Nobody thought that was a good way to build a product. So when Lean and Agile came about, it was, oh, great, fantastic. We can start to experiment. We can start to you know, validate. We can get these super, uh, faster cycles. And so it was a combination of both that, that change in the way that software was being developed and the, the sort of the director from the top we were then able to inject this idea of you know a culture of experimentation uh where we state our assumptions we validate hypotheses um and that that was terminology that had been introduced elsewhere and so in, in the research team we you know took that on and sort of tried to change the language you know it helped change the language of the whole division and when you start to change the language then people start to behave differently and it just started sort of rolled we, we're still going through that transformation but like I say, when I look back 20 years ago, over 20 years ago when I joined, and now it's, it's, a, it's a, the difference is, is remarkable. It's, ama it's amazing to hear and it's inspirational, right? Because I, I hate to, uh, I'll just say, it. if Microsoft can do it, <laughs> anyone, anyone can do it, right? I mean, I mean look, I'm, I'm talking about really from, from a, a legacy and size perspective, right? So it, it, that's, that's super impressive. Thanks for sharing that. Yep. Your thoughts or comments? Bobby, are you trying to say something? Mike? I'm going to put my uh, email address in the chat. So if you do think about something after the fact, feel free to reach out and, uh, and ask. But um, I'll tell you, Robin, I'm not, like I said, I'm not terribly surprised there aren't any questions. This is, this is one of those things that's like, Okay. Everyone's just doing, everyone. everyone's like, what can I do about this? What's the next great thing that I need to question? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, but look, but it's, I think it's important, right? And I think that, that certainly my expectation is not that everyone knows, can, can predict every real world negative consequence about the products that they're building, but um, we keep an eye on for that kind of stuff. I think, I think we had one question over here. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, great. Uh, like you said, like reflection on you said, what can I do with that? Uh, I'm running some classes with, uh, sorry, that's na next meeting. Uh, I'm running classes for product management and product ownership, something like that. A uh, lot of stuff that needed to be put on, especially about the consequences of developing products. That's what I'm going to do with this. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Amazing, thank you, that sounds great. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, guys, we can wrap up. I wanted to thank everyone for coming. I wanted to thank you, Jeff. Uh, this was fantastic. And um, this is uh, this is actually the last talk of our, our speaker series, but we have recorded this. We will share out the recording with everyone. Um, Jeff, I saw that you posted your email in here, like you were saying. So that's great. Um, and thank you all, and have a have a great day, and have a great weekend. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me, folks. Thanks for coming, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Thanks guys. Be safe. Thank, thank you. you guys. Bye. Thank you, Jeff. Thank Rob. Bye.